Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so if you don't know me, um, I've been around since I as a developer for a long time. I actually was a partner here at Gaslight for a couple years and then was a partner over at Differential for a couple years and uh, left to, to do more full-time teaching, um, which is about 50% of what I do, teaching, and then the other 50% is uh, development work. So, uh, But all of it is 100% media work at this point. And so I thought I'd talk about you know, why use Meteor uh, after using it for a couple years now. So you can find me at all these places. Um, <clears throat> I run the, uh, I run a, a newsletter called Meteor Club. I do, uh, actually I gotta change the slide. It's called Crater Podcast now. Um, and then run Crater IO, which is a new site, kind of like Reddit just for Meteor, React, and Node News. So, so what is, Meteor exactly. It's a platform. Um, it's, you know, you hear everyone talk about a framework, and I think Meteor aspires to be a little bit bigger than that. They want to help you get the front end and the back end all working together, and then you can start to do interesting things. And so um, I've got a slide here. Yeah, so you can kind of see when you type Meteor Run, you're actually executing a node server um, kind of off to the right here, which runs Mongo and it runs Node and they're all kind of hooked up, up together for you. And then you also have this kind of communication between the, the web browser. So you get this little bit of HTML that's delivered from Node uh, and it's got just enough to bootstrap the environment and start pulling data over. So uh, you just deliver a JavaScript bundle and then um, it'll, make a DDP connection, which is how data is shipped back and forth over real time. So it opens a web socket and uh, uses little JSON messages to send data back and forth. And so this, this is, uh, they're calling it uh, connected client concept. So it's a little bit different than maybe a traditional Rails type framework where you ask for a page, it knits together some HTML and delivers it to you instead you just get like a tiny bit of HTML and some JavaScript and then data flows in and then the HTML is all knit together on the client. So, kind of nifty. Uh, and then the other interesting thing that happens is, you know, because you, you've got this, you're in this node environment and uh, you can easily tap into things like Cordova and so we can just say media run iOS and it's gonna fire off an iOS simulator and uh, we'll have a running Cordova application right out of the box. So that's kind of handy as well. And we'll get into that after, after the slides. I'll show you some. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm used to talking at JavaScript conferences. Um, but, you know, I think you, you could replace the mean stack with Rails or Phoenix or anything else, really. And there's a lot of... Um, I guess a lot of time spent picking and choosing the things that you want to work together in order to make a, a framework that's going to deliver your application for you. And so, you know, Kevin earlier was talking about uh, spending more hours than he wanted to on putting together a bus detective with Rails and uh, Ember and that kind of thing. And like that all just happens out of the box. You don't have to worry about that with Meteor. You just kind of start writing some JavaScript code and put some data in and it should show up on the front end if you're querying it correctly. And so I, I think to me that leads to getting started pretty fast. Um, I think that's, when you, when you hear people talk about Meteor, one of the things they'll say is, oh, it's great for prototyping. And I would agree with that. I think it is super great for prototyping. Um, you know, I've participated in a number of hackathons and been able to put together quite polished apps in 24 to 48 hours, uh, a lot more than, say, I've done with, with uh, Rails. Um, you know, I was on a, I did Rails Rumble for a number of years and we'd have a four-man team and we'd put something together and I feel like I'm putting out similar quality with Meteor, so, in the same amount of time, just by myself, so, kind of interesting to me. Um, so Atmosphere, this is the package system that comes with Meteor. Uh, the interesting thing here 
is that with the packages, you can deliver a client code, you can deliver server code, you can deliver your code to both places if you want. So that's the, you know, if you hear people talk about universal code or isomorphic code, that's what they're talking about. Um, the, the package system that you can use with Meteor is, is pretty awesome. It's, it's everything that I wanted Rails engines to be, but they never really were. Um, so it, it's, it's super easy to go and write, like the functionality that comes with the accounts UI package is a great example. I just type Meteor add accounts UI, and then you get like a, a little login button that just functions like all the way. And you know, it's got HTML snippets, it's got database schema, it's got like all that stuff. And you don't have to worry about it, like that's all taken care of for you. So that is very, very handy and uh, helps a lot with, with getting things off the ground. Uh, the other great thing about Meteor is that it directly integrates with NPM. So I can write a package that pulls in any other NPM package that I want. So I can rely on any other code that sits in the node kind of ecosystem. Uh, for instance, this was uh, a package we wrote while I was at Differential, and it relies on a Stripe NPM package. And it implements the web hooks and kind of all the stuff that you would need to do to get billing working with a Meteor app. And you could just install this, give it a couple keys, and you were off to the races with a subscription in your, in your Meteor app, which is pretty handy. This is the other great thing. So this was like, uh, to me, this was the, the dark horse of Meteor 1.0 coming out. Like no one really, they just kind of like snuck this in there in 092. Like, oh yeah, by the way, we've got Cordova integration. And it turns out like that has actually been pretty amazing. Uh, the, the last two projects that I have done have been building mobile apps of which, you know, I, I don't know Objective-C and I don't really, care to learn it all that much. Uh, I, I like JavaScript, so uh, I, I think this is awesome. And you're able to rely, it's, it's even easier now that it's just NPM, but um, you're able to just pull in any Cordova package that you want. So if you need in-app browser or um, you know, uh, screen rotation stuff, like all that stuff's super easy to pull in. So kind of handy. I also think that one of the reasons you should think about Meteor or some sort of client front end at this stage of the game, I think most people know like Facebook and Twitter and all these other applications have driven the mindset of, you know, I, I open a web page and then I'm just getting updates. I don't have to hit refresh. And I think clients and customers like expect that to happen now. And so you should be thinking about that in some way. And I think Meteor gives you an easy way to kind of deliver on that story. Um, you know, they, they hook into Mongo and anytime data changes, it just gets shipped to the front end. And I can show you what that looks like. Uh, it's, pr it's, pretty, it's pretty great, honestly. I also think this is a, an older screenshot, but um, I, haven't, I haven't seen a pretty graph like this. But, if you go and there are websites, I think it's like github.info, um, it shows that this trend is just continuing with JavaScript. Uh, it's like outpacing uh, Java by like 2x, I think, as far as libraries on GitHub. Uh, and that's, to me, that, that makes it, there's, there's a couple of benefits there. One, a lot of people know it. Um, so that makes it easier to hire for. And I think that's, that's an important thing to think about when you're building a business. You, you don't want to be stuck having to hire an expert. You want someone who can maybe come in and they know like two years of JavaScript, they're good to go. Um, but like two years of Phoenix experience, I think that would probably cost you a lot of money right now. So. I also think, you know, this is the other reason why JavaScript's so popular. It's what I think Sun wanted Java to be. It actually like literally runs everywhere. It runs on pretty much every device you can think of. They've got some kind of JavaScript support for it. So that makes it really, really easy to start targeting new devices with the builds that you're doing. And you know, that's that's kind of what Cordova is doing for us. So it's also another interesting point. 
it, it, so I, JavaScript is, is a gateway drug, and I'll just say, like, um, I've worked with several designers, and, you know, they, they always struggle getting into Ruby, getting into Rails, and figuring out, like, okay, what command do I run again? But I think we've gotten to the point where um, most of the designers I know know enough JavaScript to be dangerous. Like, they know jQuery, or they know how to find a plugin and install it on the front end and get it working. And uh, when I was at Differential, I had the pleasure of working with a guy there. And, you know, he was a designer. He knew just a little bit of jQuery. And he could figure out how to, like, get a masonry um, package installed and working and functioning and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but he, he's actually the one that maintained the um, Differential Bootstrap starter app that they had. And I, the, to me, that was really interesting. When you have a group of eight or nine developers and one designer, and like the designer is the one making decisions about what belongs in the starter app, uh, that that's kind of interesting. And then, just you know, he's he's gotten to the point now where he built an entire app on his own, and he's left Differential, and he's gotten into Uptech, and you know they're they're uh, pursuing building a business, and he's pretty much playing the role of CTO. And I think that, to me, is pretty, pretty awesome. So I think uh, JavaScript makes that easy. And the fact that it's JavaScript on the front end and back end with Meteor makes that, that a good fit, at least for his case, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, this is a picture of DevShop. They do this every month in San Francisco. And so, I mean, they, they pack this room out. Like, I've been here three times for this thing, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, they cater in food, and they have speakers for two hours. And, um, you know, it's just awesome. The, uh, the other interesting thing is the doors open at 2 p.m., and the talks don't start till 7. And so it's just community people hanging out, helping each other. They've got a little app they put up on the screen up there that says, hey, I need help. So it's almost like a little, like, in-person Stack Overflow kind of board up top. Um, and I, I just think that kind of permeates into the rest of the community. I've I found it to be a very positive experience talking with people and interacting with them. They seem super helpful and interested. And it's just, it's been kind of a, a big, uh, big difference from coming from 10 years of Rails. So. Uh, so this is, this is actually what alerted me to Meteor. I was a Rails Cast Pro subscriber and trying to figure out, like, you know, where do I go from here? Do I learn Angular? Do I learn Ember? You know, I played a lot with Backbone, um, built some Backbone apps with Chris Nelson, actually. And then started to play with Angular and just didn't really like it all that much. And uh, looking at Ember, felt like it didn't really make sense to me either. Um, and so I started watching these videos. And he did, a, a, like, a, he basically built the same application over and over again in the different client-side frameworks. And each one, you can see there, like, Ember was a two-part uh, episode there. And it was 14 minutes for the second episode. Same thing pretty much for everything. Backbone, Angular, all of them were, were two-parters that were 10 to 15 minutes each. Uh, whereas Meteor was just one episode and, what's it say, 15 minutes? So like he built the same app in half the time. And I can say, like having built uh, 10, I guess 12 or 13 apps now in, in Meteor professionally for clients, um, I think that holds up. I'd say it's about 30% faster than, than I ever was in Rails. Yeah. Or Is there an obvious place where there's like a big win a, that gives you that, that speed improvement? I would say the package system is pretty helpful for that. Um, and then just, uh, yeah, I guess the, the package system would definitely be a big one. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, for me, I don't have to switch contexts. Um, so that's, that's a little bit easier. I don't have to like 
come over here and think about Active Record and Ruby and how do I query this, this Postgres data and then output it to JSON and come over here into JavaScript land and think about how to digest that and put it on the page. Um, it's just kind of like, it, you'll see in a minute, like I just, I write one query and then it's on the page. So that helps a lot too. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it, yes, but I think that's true of most frameworks or platforms that you're going to use. There's going to be a point where you, you hit a difficult point, um, and like scaling an application is very different from building an application. And so, you know, you, you look at Twitter today versus Twitter on, you know, week 13 that they were building it, it's very different applications at this point. And uh, I think that's, that's true of anything that you're going to endeavor to do. And software is a thing that you maintain. Uh, but I, I do think that being able to rely on some of these packages makes it, makes it super easy to kind of not have to worry about parts of your application. And so actually, this is, uh, I think it's easy to separate Meteor apart into different pieces. Uh, Excuse me, and they've, they've started to do it. So if you look on the front end here, maybe I should make that darker, but where it says Blaze under the render part, they've actually already replaced it, and you can put in React or Angular if you want in the front end now. And so that part's become swappable. And so if you look at each of these kind of connectors as a place where you could swap a piece out, it becomes kind of interesting. So on the client side, right now we have mini Mongo, so it's like a, a, a little mini memory representation of what you've queried from the server, and it's been sent to you. You just leave it there in the memory, and you can query against that. Uh, they're working to switch that out, so they're trying to replace Mongo with Postgres at this point, and uh, offer it as a swap point. And so we'll get Postgres and then mini Postgres, most likely, and that's, that's kind of interesting. And then DDP itself uh, is also another good swap point. That's how the communication is happening back and forth between the client and the server. And, you know, it's a, it's a standard that they've put together, and it's pretty easy to follow. Um, you know, I've seen other people implement it. James implemented a, an Elixir DDP uh, client-side consumer library. So. I, I, to me, that's also compelling. Like when it comes time to switch from, you know, say Node to um, Elixir, that's that's something you could theoretically do, and I've seen people do. Um, you know, there's a there's a guy Aranoda in the Meteor community. He does a lot of work on scaling, and he's got an app similar to um, New Relic, and he's using Go with DDP, and uh, in a Mongo database and kind of pushing data to the to the front end of a Meteor application. So, you know, Meteor or Node wasn't able to scale to the point that he wanted it to, so he switched it out for Go. And I think that that to me that's a compelling story. And so, I stole this slide. Just I think it's interesting, and we can talk about it for a second. If if you are scaling and you have two Meteor applications. Um, the way that you handle kind of the real-time updates, uh, by default, like the, the old Meteor applications would run what they called a polling diff. It would say, I care about this data, and Node would sit there and re-poll for the data against Mongo like every 10 seconds, which was really CPU intensive and not a great way to do it. And so instead what they've done is they've turned the Meteor servers into op-log consumers, and so they act like they're part of a replica set and so if you have a replica URL, you can just listen in to the updates that the replicas are being sent, and Meteor just consumes that and then sends that out to the clients. And so you're able to get um, super easy, kind of cheap, non-CPU intensive updates out to the clients. And it's, it's near real time between the servers, uh, which wasn't the case before. If you had two servers, you know, when server A got an update and wrote it to the Mongo database, server B wouldn't get it for, you know, five, 10 seconds at that point. All right, any questions before I show off some code? No? All right.
So I've got an app that I built. If you've heard of Urban Spoon, this will maybe look sort of familiar. This is made to be on a phone. Um, but the idea is when you, when you load this up, it just asks you if it can use your location. And then it, it starts grabbing points from the Google Local API. And so as I drag the map around, we should get more map markers. And that's actually pulling the API real time and then caching it into the local Mongo database on my machine. And these are all the restaurants and bars that are around here. And so I, I set it up kind of naively. It just grabs the first 20. When you say sticking in Mongo on your machine, do you mean on the server side of your machine, or is that the mini one that's running in the client side? Uh, the one on the server side of my machine, yeah. So every time you move the map, I make what's called a meteor method call. It's kind of like an RPC call, and tell it to go fetch more data from Google. And then it takes that data and shoves it into the, the Mongo database. And then the client has a query running, and it'll get that all through DDP. I realize I'm saying a lot of words that probably sound crazy. Um, get this over here, and it'll. Come on, snap. So if we look here, I can filter down to the web socket, and we can actually look at the frames going back and forth. And so you can see uh, the green is my computer sending messages through web socket, and then white is the response. And so I connect and uh, tell them the version that I have, and then tell them I want this subscription. Uh, this one's for doing I guess I didn't talk about it, but doing the auto update stuff. So it compares the version of the application that was delivered to my machine to the one that's on the server. And if, if I update new code on the server, it'll tell the client to refresh and pull down the latest version. So it's called a hot code push. And that also works with Cordova, which is a, a little um, controversial. I've seen some people like get their app rejected because of that. But basically, you can deliver a whole updated app without having to go through the app store review process. So, um, And then right here, I ask for nearby places. So that's the publication that I've set up. And um, you can see I start getting places sent to me with all the data already in there, so like photo references. I haven't used any of that stuff yet, but price level too. So if I click on one of these, you'll get it like a dollar sign. Excuse me. I can't get my location now. There it goes. So you can see, like as I zoom in, It calls fetch nearby locations, and then it resubscribes with a new kind of bounding box to get all the points that are within that map marker zone. And then it populates them onto the map for us. And so this, I mean, it's not a ton of code here. Let me bring this over. Can you guys read that OK? So this is um, the file on the left is where we make the fetch nearby location calls. And we're literally just calling HTTP get to Google, getting some data back. And then we just do an upsert with uh, the Google kind of location ID as our key that we care about that, that matters. So that way, we only insert the data once. Uh, but we'll get updates, right? So if someone changes their phone number or something, like we'll get that and put it, stash it in our database. Um, and then over here on the right, this is the, the publication. So we're able to just pass it 
the map bottom left and top right, and then we can use that to draw kind of a geo box, and we can query for all the points within that box. And so line six on the right there is just, I mean, that was it to get all the, the mapping points. And then on the front end, it was about 60 lines of code to get the map working. Uh, so I used leaflet, and basically this onCreated block just runs any time the template is being created into the DOM. And so I just set some things, like the map render, it's false, because we haven't rendered it yet, and then empty out any markers we have, and then set up the bottom left and top right as variables that we're tracking. And then I ask the map to give us the boundaries of it currently, and then we just do our subscribe call, and that's that, you know, that green nearby places that you saw, and then we get the white kind of responses with the map markers. And so line 19 is, is really what's driving kind of the real-time updating that's happening back and forth. And then the rest of this stuff is all just to set up the actual drawing of the map, and then as you move the map around, we call and tell it to get more locations and that kind of thing. And this is all up on GitHub. I can, I can have Chris send it out later. Any questions about any of that? And so this is what I was talking about before. I just type media run iOS and it should fire up a simulator for me. Sure, James. Mm -mm. No, I'm, I'm using Blaze on the front end right now. Oh. Yeah, and this is actually um, a port of Ionic for the UI as well. So it's called Meteoric. Um, but they've removed Angular and just used Blaze. But at this point, it's, it's very easy if you want to use React. Uh, you use something called uh, Git Meteor Data, and they've they've given you like a hook to push that real time data in, and basically you just kind of like push it down through your child templates if you need to. And so here it just asks me if it can use my location. I think I've got to pull up the map. It's not coming up. Should come up with Apple here. Oh, that's right. It doesn't work on iOS right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's like some kind of leaflet bug that I, I never did fix the last time I gave the demo, so. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, I mean, I actually have a whole article on this. Because people said, oh, hey, it's hard to debug Meteor. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's actually pretty easy. Um, so obviously, you have kind of the standard console log here. Um, but you can also do a Meteor shell. And so I can go down here, and it's just like IRB or you know any, any other standard option, REPL. Just type Meteor Shell. And with the running app somewhere else, like it'll connect in and allow me to start issuing commands. And so you can start looking at, um, excuse me, the whole Meteor API here, right? So it's got like tab completion and that kind of stuff. So you can write code in the shell if you want. No. Um, I mean, theoretically, you could. Yeah, like if you tracked the sessions, I, I bet you could do that. Um, I've, done, I've done some funky stuff with like 
clients connecting in, and like I keep track of all the clients in the database, and then tell them to like flip to a new slide. I wrote some like synchronized slide flipping tool early on, but you could probably do something similar to that. Um, and then it's got just the regular Chrome debugger here. Oh, that's the wrong one. Get it back up. And so you can just see, like, these are all the compiled files, actually. Let me expand this. So this is all that. The HTML being compiled into a spacebars template. Um, here we go. So this is like where we're setting up the marker. So I could just put a put a debugger point right there. Hit refresh, hit map, and then it triggers right there. And so we can see this is a template instance, and we can start doing things with it if we needed to. And you can do the same thing if you just put uh, the keyword debugger in your code and save it. When the client hits that, it'll break point right there as well. And then you can also do, if you need to do server side debugging, You can uh, start Meteor, Meteor debug, and then if you put that debugger breakpoint in somewhere, it'll, it'll stop on it, and it gives you that node inspector kind of window, if you've seen that before. So you get this URL right here, and you just connect into it, and it looks a lot like Chrome, basically but it's actually instrumented inside of Node. And so we can pause anywhere in there that we want to, uh, which is pretty, pretty handy. That, that was like, probably took them half a day to add that to the platform. It's kind of nice. And then the other thing, and this is where things get a little trickier, is when we're doing iOS, uh, let's see, Safari. I'll do it over here, you can see it. So you can tell it to connect, when you start Safari, you can tell it to connect to a simulator that's running. And I can tell it local, and it's actually gonna connect in, and I get the console, whoops, to that. And so, maybe we'll see the air. No, we don't see the air. Maybe if I refresh. There it is. So I can't, fetch the map background for some reason. I'm guessing some kind of cores policy problem or something. So those are all the different ways to debug in Meteor. And a lot of those apply to either Node or JavaScript in general as well. So. Any other questions? Is Meteor fun? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm biased, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I spend all my time in it, so I, I would say that, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of fun, um, particularly with some of the, the updates that I think will be coming out soon. I think it's, it's gonna be pretty interesting. Um, if, if nothing else, I think the Cordova integration could probably keep me in enough work for years if I wanted to. Um, but teaching it is a lot of fun as well. Because I think it's JavaScript, being that, that gateway drug that I talked about, like it's easy to teach people JavaScript. And they can immediately do things in a browser. And I think that's kind of exciting for them. And so, I mean, you can sit down and prototype an app without touching the server side in probably like an hour or two hours, which is, I think it's pretty rewarding for, for people. So that's pretty awesome. Sure. They do. Um, 
they've actually taken a metric ton in cash from Andreessen Horowitz and uh, other investors. Um, they're called the Meteor Development Group. They're in San Francisco. I think they're at like 30 people now. Um, half that is a marketing team and the other half are developers kind of putting out the open source framework. And then their goal is to build, they've already built a platform called Galaxy, uh, which does hosting for you. And uh, it's a little pricey right now. They're trying to, I think, maybe um, slow down growth in the application while they build a support team and understand like how to, how to build this side of their business. So it's $500 a month is the starting price. Um, but I think, you know, they've got like 20 businesses on it right now. And once they feel comfortable, they said they're going to start lowering the, the entry cost level down to something that developers could afford if they wanted to put an application out. What do you, do you use for hosting? Uh, right now, I use um, DigitalOcean. So I've got uh, this class I teach, and it's... Um, it's all video based and so this is all built in Meteor and it's got like the Stripe integration and that kind of stuff um, and then craters also run there and this this actually gets a pretty fair amount of traffic I need to optimize it. it's a little slower than I wanted it to be but um, I, I don't know why I did this but I set up the database lives in US East in Amazon Web Services but the server lives in DigitalOcean, so I need to, I need to move the database, uh, and that'll speed it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, pretty much everything I, I host on DigitalOcean right now. But the language itself is open source, right? So if like, you wanted to change something, you could have um, It's just JavaScript. So the platform, yeah, it's, it's all open sourced. Sorry, I forgot about that part of your question. And it's actually really just a big collection of packages once you start digging into it. Um, so this is like all the stuff that kind of comes with core. And uh, so you can see here, this is like Twitter. This is handling all the OAuth Twitter authentication stuff if you install that piece of it. Um, what else is there? Like here's, this is Spacebar, so they have four handlebars. That's what they were originally built on, but this is like a real-time version of handlebars. Um, so I mean, this, this all sits out here. The only thing that I would say is they're really bad about accepting pull requests. Uh, it's something like, I think 10 days on average. Um, but I found if you're like outside of MDG, it actually takes way longer than that to get something accepted. But you can, you can actually tell you can put a fork out there yourself and you can tell Meteor to grab that fork when it starts up. And so um, the, the testing framework is called Velocity and um, they maintain their own fork with all the instrumented, instrumented uh, kind of testing hooks and stuff. And so when you start up Velocity, it goes and downloads that fork that Velocity has out there, the Velocity team. So that's also kind of cool. And you can, you know, grab their packages and fix them and put them out on Atmosphere if you wanted to. And this is all built in Meteor as well. And so it shows you, like, these are all the latest release packages. These are the ones that are seem to be getting a lot of downloads. And then down here they have, like, trending packages, or most used. huh? The lines are like downloads, so they don't, it's a spark graph, but they don't give you any kind of point of reference for it. I think it's supposed to be like two weeks worth of downloads. So you can see like a lot of the trending ones are on an upward kind of slope. And then they've also done some interesting things too. So when you search for like bootstrap, they, uh, they look at the number of downloads a package has gotten, how many stars it has, when's the last time it was released, and they try to like factor all that into an algorithm and, and show you the best packages first. So. Any 
Mm -hmm. I would say uh, start right here at meteor.com, run the install, and then they've got a tutorial that'll kind of walk you through building a to-do app. Um, yeah, and then from there, you can just hit my blog, and I've got a ton of resources in a post called Getting Started with Meteor. And I've got like a ton of links on all kinds of different things you might want to read up on.